Hi Year 3, Miss Fiddler here. We're going to keep reading the story of Tracy Beaker today, which I know you read yesterday with Mrs Horner, and I'm pretty sure you read up to page 24. So you should be on a page that looks like this now. If you haven't got your book, can you please go and grab it? You can pause me um, if you need to go and get it, because I'd like you to read along with me. You also might need your task sheet, the printouts that Mrs Horner spoke about yesterday that your parents should have got for you because on there is your task for today. Now, we're not going to do the task as we go along, but it might be good to familiarise yourself with what you're going to be doing after we've done the reading. Um, as we're reading, we are going to be introduced to some different people in Tracy's life and we're trying to figure out today whether she has a positive or a not so good relationship with these people. And if we can, try and find some evidence as to why we think that. Maybe something that she said or something that's happened with that person. So that's what we're going to do once we've done the reading. But like always, before we start answering questions about the text, we need to read the text. So you should have yours in front of you on page 24. And we're going to read up to page 37. My own story. Use this space to write your story. The story of Tracy Beaker. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Tracy Beaker. That sounds a bit stupid, like the start of a soppy fairy story. I can't stand fairy stories. They're all the same. If you're very good and very beautiful with long golden curls, then after sweeping up a few cinders or having a long kip in a cobwebby place, this prince comes along and you live happily ever after. I think she's making a reference to a couple of different fairy tales there. Long golden curls, possibly Rapunzel. Um, sweeping a few cinders, Cinderella, and having a long kip in a cobwebby place. Now, kip is asleep, so I'm assuming that she's talking about sleeping beauty there, or maybe even Snow White, possibly. Which is fine if you happen to be a goody-goody and look gorgeous, but if you're bad and ugly, then you've got no chance whatsoever. You get given a silly name like Rumpelstiltskin, and nobody invites you to their party, and no one's ever grateful, e even when you do them a whopping great favour. So of course you get a bit cheesed off with this sort of treatment. You stamp your feet in a rage and fall right through the floorboards, if you or you scream yourself into a frenzy and you get locked up in a tower and they throw away the key. I've done a bit of stamping and screaming in my time. There's a nice little picture of her stomping and screaming. Have you ever stomped and screamed like that? I think we can all admit that we all stomped and screamed like that once upon a time. And I've been locked up heaps of times. Once they locked me up all day long and all night. Now, I'm, I, she might have been locked in her room by, 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 possibly. I have a feeling it's not going to be quite like being locked in a room like a Disney or a fairy tale princess. Maybe not quite as horrid. That was the first home when I wouldn't settle because I wanted my mum so much. I was just little then, but they still locked me up. I'm not fibbing, although I do have a tendency to tell a few fibs now and then. What's a fib? I think Mrs Horner asked you what a fib was yesterday. Do you think that what a fib is? Can you use any inference from the text there? A fib is when we tell a little lie, don't tell the truth. Although I do have a tendency to tell a few fibs now and then, now and again, it's funny. Auntie Peggy used to call it telling fairy stories. I'd say something like, guess what, Auntie Peggy? I just met my mum in the back garden and she gave me a ride in her flash new sports car. We went down the shopping arcade and she bought me my very own huge bottle of scent, that posh poison one, just like the bottle Uncle Sid gave you for your birthday. And I was messing about with it, playing murderers, and then the bottle sort of tipped and it's gone all over me, as I expect you'd notice. But it's my scent, not yours. I don't know what happened to yours. I think one of the other kids took it. That definitely sounds like a fib. That sounds like a story that she's made up to try and get herself out of trouble because she knows that she's going to be in trouble. You know, this sort of thing. I'd make it dead convincing, but Auntie Peggy wouldn't even listen properly. She'd just shake, off her, head, shake her head at me and get all cross and red and say, Oh, Tracy, you naughty girl, you're telling fairy stories again. Then she'd give me a smack. Oh, that's not nice. Foster mothers aren't supposed to smack you at all. I told Elaine that Aunt Peggy used to smack me, and Elaine sighed and said, Well, sometimes, Tracy, you really do ask for it. Now, I'm pretty sure that you spoke to Mrs Horner yesterday about who Elaine is and what Elaine's supposed to do with Tracy. And Elaine's job is to keep Tracy safe and things. And that doesn't sound like she's keeping Tracy safe to me. Which is a lie in itself. 
I have never in my life said, Auntie Peggy, please would you give me a great big smack? And her smacks really hurt too, right on the back of your legs where it stings most. I didn't like that Aunt Peggy at all. If I was in a real fairy story, I'd put a curse on her. A huge wart right on the end of her nose. Frogs and toads coming wriggling out of her mouth every time she tries to speak. No, I can make a better one than that. She can have permanent huge great bogies hanging off her nose that won't go away no matter how many times she blows it. And whenever she tries to speak, she'll make a terribly loud, rude noise. Great. Oh dear, you can't win. Elaine, my stupid old social worker, was sitting beside me when I started writing the story of Tracy Beaker. And I got the giggles making up my brilliant curses for Auntie Peggy. And Elaine looked surprised and said, what are you laughing at, Tracy? I said, mind your own business. And she said, now, Tracy. And then she looked at what I'd written, which is a bit of a cheek, seeing as it's supposed to be very private. She sighed when she got to the Aunt Peggy part and said, really, Tracy? And I said, yes, really, Elaine? And she sighed, and then her lips moved for a moment or two. That's her taking a deep breath and counting up to ten. Social workers are supposed to do that when the child is being difficult. Elaine ends up, ends up doing it an awful lot. El Elaine ends up doing an awful lot of counting when she's with me. When she goes to ten, she gives me this big false smile like this. And there's a drawing of Elaine trying to give her a smile. Can you give that fake smile? Very sarcastic smile. Can you do it at me? Now look, Tracy, said Elaine, this is your own special book about you. Something that you're going to keep forever. You don't want to spoil it by writing all sorts of silly, cheeky, rude things in it, do you? I said, it's my life and it hasn't been very special so far, has it? So I would not write any old rubbish. Then she sighed again, but sympathetically this time. Sympathetically. It's a really long word, but that's to give sympathy. So you're, um, you're thinking about somebody else and how they're feeling as opposed to how you might be feeling. And she put her arm around me and said, Hey, I know you've had a hard time, but you're very special. You know that, don't you? I shook my head and tried to wriggle away. Yes, you are, Tracy. Very, very special, Elaine said, hanging on to me. Then, if I'm so very special, how come no one wants me? I said. Oh dear, I knew it must have been very disappointing for you when your second placement went wrong. Love, but you mustn't let it depress you too much. Sooner or later, you'll find the perfect, perfect placement. Fantastic rich family? Maybe a family, or maybe a single person, if somebody really suitable came along. I gave her this look, this long look. You're single, Elaine. And I bet you're suitable. So why don't you foster me, eh? It was her turn to wriggle then. Well, Tracy, you know how it is. I mean, I've got my job. I have to deal with lots of children. But if you fostered me, you could stop bothering with all the other children, others and just look after me. They give you money if you foster. I bet they give you lots of extra because I'm difficult. And I've got behaviour problems and all that. How about it, Elaine? It would be fun. Honest, it would. I'm sure it would be lots of fun, Tracy, but I'm sorry it's just not on, Elaine said. She tried to give me a big hug, but I pushed her hard. I was only joking, I said. Yuck! I couldn't stand the thought of living with you. You're stupid and boring and you're all fat and wobbly. I'd absolutely hate the idea of you being in my foster mum. There's a part of me that thinks that Tracy's saying those things just to be unkind because Elaine didn't go the way that Tracy wanted her to go. I can understand why you're angry with me, Tracy, said Elaine, trying to look cool and calm, but sucking in her stomach at this all the same. I think she's sucking in her stomach because of what Tracy said. I told her I wasn't a bit angry, although I shouted it as I said it. I told her I didn't care a bit, though I had these silly watery eyes. Didn't cry though. I don't ever cry. Sometimes people think I do, but it's just my hay fever. I think that's another one of Tracy's fibs. I expect you're going to think of all these sorts of revolting curses for me now, said Elaine. I'm doing it right this minute, I told her. Okay, she said. You have always say, you always say okay, I told her. You know, okay, that's fine with me. If that's what you want, I'm not going to make a fuss. Okay, Tracy, yes, I know you've got this stocking. 
socking great axe in your hand and you're about to chop off my head because you're feeling angry with me. But okay, if that's the way you feel, I'm not going to get worried about it because I'm the super cool social worker. She burst out laughing then. No one can say super cool when you're around Tracy, she said. Look, kiddo, you write whatever you want in your life story. It's your own book after all. So that's it. This is my own book and I can write whatever I want. Only I'm not quite sure what I do want, actually. Maybe Elaine could help after all. She's over the other side of the sitting room, helping that wet Peter with his book. He hasn't got a clue. He's filling it with... He's filling it in. He's filling it all in so slowly and so seriously, not writing in it, but printing it, it with that silly, blotchy biro of his, trying to do it ever so carefully, but failing miserably. And now he's smudged some of it, so it looks a mess anyway. I just called Elaine, but she says she's got to help Peter for a bit. The poor little kettle is getting all worried in case he puts the wrong answers, as if it's some dopey intelligence test. I've done heaps of them, intelligence tests. They're all e ever so easy peasy. I can do them as quick as a wink. They always accept, um, they always expect kids in care to be as thick as bricks, but I get a hundred out of a hundred nearly every time. Well, they don't tell you the answers, but I bet I do. It's a bit written here. That's interesting. I like a different handwriting. Tracy Beaker is a stupid show-off and this is the silliest load of rubbish I've ever read. And if she's so super intelligent, how come she wets her bed like a baby? Why would Tracy write that about herself? Let's keep reading. Ignore the stupid scribble up above. Hmm. It's all lies anyway. It's typical. You can't leave anything for two minutes in this rotten place without one of the other kids spoiling it but I never thought anyone would stoop so low as to write in my own private life story. And I know just who did it too. I know, Justine Littlewood. And just, you just wait, I'm going to get you. I went over to rescue Elaine from the boring, wimpy little Peter, and I had a little peer into his book, and I nearly fell over, because you'll never guess who he's put as his best friend. Me. Me! It's all, is this some sort of joke? I demanded. He went all red and mumbly and tried to hide what he'd put, but I'd already seen it. My best friend is Tracy Beaker. It was down there on the page in black and white. Well, not your actual book of black and white, more your smudgy blue biro, but you know what I mean. Go away and stop pestering poor Peter, Elaine said to me. Yes, but he's putting absolute rubbish in his book, Elaine, and it's stupid. I'm not Peter Ignam's best friend. Well, I think that's very nice that Peter wants you to be his best friend, said Elaine. She pulled a funny face. There's no accounting for taste. Oh, ha, ha. Why did you put that, Peter? Peter did a little squeak about sharing birthdays. So that made us friends. It does not make us friends, Dumbo, I declared. Elaine started getting on at me, that, then saying I was being nasty to poor little Petey Weety. And if I couldn't be friendly, why didn't I just push off and get on with my own life story? Well, when people tell me to push off, I generally try to stick to them like glue, just to be annoying. So that's what I did. And then Jenny called me into the kitchen because she made out that she wanted a hand getting the lunch ready. But, she, it, but that was just a ploy. A ploy means like a, like a distraction, a plan. Jenny doesn't smack. She doesn't even often, um, often tell, you that, tell you off. She just uses ploys to try and distract you. It sometimes works with the thicker kids, but it usually has no effect whatsoever on me. However, I quite like helping in the kitchen because you can generally nick a spoonful of jam or a handful of raisins when Jenny's back is turned. So I went along to the kitchen and helped her put an entire shoal of fish fingers under the double grill while she was in the while she got the chips chip pan bubbling. A shoal of fish is what like a group of fish is called. So I think Trace is trying to say that there's a whole shoal, a whole group of fish fingers underneath the grill. Fish fingers don't taste so great when they're raw. I tried nibbling just to see. I don't know why they're all called fish fingers. They don't have fingers, do they? They ought to be fish fins. That Aunt Peggy used to make this awful milk pudding called tapicota, which had these little slimy bubbly bits in and told the other kids that they were fish eyes. And I told the really l little ones that the marmalade is made out of goldfish and they believed that too. When Jenny started serving out the fish fingers and chips, I went back to the sitting room to tell everyone that lunch was ready. And I remember seeing Louise and Justine hunched in the corner, giggling over something they'd got hidden. I don't know. I am highly intelligent. I truly wasn't making that up. 
and yet it was a bit thick of me to, to not twig what they were up to. I was just reading my own life story and then scribbling all over it. A little twit like Peter Ignam would tell, but I'm no telltale tip. I shall simply get my own back. I shall think long and carefully for a suitable, horrible revenge. I don't half hate that, Justine. Before she came, Louise and I were best friends and we did everything together. And even though I was still dumped in a rotten children's home, it really wasn't so bad. Louise and I made out that we were sisters and we had all these secrets and one of these secrets was about a certain small problem that I have a nighttime problem. I've got my own room, so it was always a private problem that only Jenny and I knew about. Only to show only to show Louise we were the best friends ever, I told her about it. I knew it wasn't a sensible move right from the start because she giggled, and she used to tease me about it a bit, even when we were still friends. And then she went off with Justine and I'd sometimes worry that she might tell on me, but I always convinced myself that she'd never stoop that low. Not Louise. But she had told. She told Justine, my worst enemy. So what am I going to do with her? So what am I going to do to her? Any ideas tickling away inside my head? Well, I could beat her up. Tick, tick, tick. I could deliver karate chows, a karate chop death blow. Tick, tick, tick. I could get my mum to come in her car and run her over, squashing her hedgehog flat. Okay, I'm going to stop there and I'd like you to close your book too so we can read on. So, that was our story. Now you can do your task where you're going to choose whether what you think her relationship is with some of the people that we just met in that part of the story. And you can flick back between pages 24 and 37 to meet those people again and see if you find any evidence as to why you think it's a good or not so good relationship. If you have any questions, don't forget you can email us and I hope you have a nice rest of your day.